I'm getting this tattoo and I'm sitting there, my arm out and like sitting like this on the tattoo table and getting a tattoo is boring. It's very boring. You wouldn't think it would be boring, but it's pretty boring. So I'm lying there looking at Mark's book across the room from me, because it's over on the radiator, and thinking, this is a really interesting, boring experience that I should think about for the talk I have to give about boringness in two days. And so one thing that I thought about in this context in which I want to bring to the critique of Mark's book, which I loved, um, is how boredom is a physical experience and how the physicality of boredom is very specific and very isolating. And it is part of the experience of being bored that you are physically or mentally isolated from other people. And so I wanna talk through this, this through in sort of three or four different points. So I wanna talk, want talk about the physical experience of boredom, boredom as a defensive reaction or a maladaptive reaction to threat or unpleasantness. Um, and then I want to go into a bit that Mark sort of touches on at the end of the book, which is the question of can boredom be resistive or subversive? If we are in an attention economy, if we're in a context, a neoliberal context, where everyone wants us to be engaged and wants us to be engaging in things and constantly moving from one thing to another, can the simple act of being bored be a resistive act? So we're gonna go through this in the now less than 10 minutes that we have and hopefully I'll get to hit all of them. So one of the things I noticed is while I was sitting for my three hour tattoo is when we were done, my artist says, you sit very well. <laughs> By which she means you lie there while I stab you with needles for three solid hours really well. And I said, that seems like a maladaptive reaction to me and she says what do you mean and I said it seems maladaptive to sit there while something you know pretty unpleasant is happening to you and not do anything and she gets this look on her face and she says oh <laughs> and then I gave her a big tip and left <laughs> and so one of the things that I'm interested in about the boredom experience is that it does have physical corollaries you do feel things when you're bored one of the things that I feel when I get bored is I feel increasingly trapped inside my body. I feel increasingly like myself in my body is getting smaller and my body is staying the same size and is receiving all the same sensations, but I have less capacity to deal with those sensations. My brain feels like it's a soda that is gradually going flat. And my, like the, my thoughts are fizzing, they're a fuse that's fizzing, but they're never getting there, they're never exploding, they're never reaching a point where something is actually going to happen. And so for me, the state of being bored is a state of being physically suspended while also receiving as much information as sort of my physical form can take in at once. And this is a very isolating feeling because I can't explain this really to anybody. If I could, I could have a conversation with someone about what it felt like and then I wouldn't be bored anymore because that would be pretty interesting. But instead, I'm stuck with the incommunicability of what it is to be me in my body. And I'm forced to either think about that, which is unpleasant, or try to not think about that, which is also unpleasant. So you're stuck in this catch-22 of acknowledge the incommunicability of the phenomenological experience of the self, or avoid that and don't. And so we're sort of, I, both of those things are similarly unpleasant. Mark talks a lot about in the book about sort of what I think of as the canonical cultural explanation of boredom, which is the bourgeois or middle-class American experience of suburbia, which is the experience for me in the descriptions that I've read of being trapped with every choice you've ever made, but the physical remnants of it. You're stuck with the house you bought, you're stuck with the wife you married, you're stuck with the kids you made, you're stuck with the bar you stopped, and you're just stuck with it forever. And this is Revolution, this is Revolution Road, this is the classic 1950s man in the gray flannel suit question of you are now living with all of your choices which is a very, for me, is a very simple step from you are now living with your body forever. This is the one you get. You don't get another one. You're stuck with everything that's coming in. You're stuck with the way that comes in. You're stuck with the way you talk to yourself. You're stuck with your wife. You're stuck with your home. You're stuck with your bar. And then, of course, someone inevitably has an, has an affair or kills themselves, which is a really interesting way to not have to do that anymore. Um, I think you, you have a comment in the book about, like, 
someone loses his mind, has a car crash, and has an affair, which is a great way to not have to deal with a wife he doesn't like anymore. And I think you meant that as a joke, but I wrote in the margin, was like, well, he doesn't. <laughs> Solve that problem. And so I'm in this position where I'm thinking, what if boredom is the maladaptive reaction to a lack of choice? It is a maladaptive reaction to a lack of power. I committed three hours before I had that conversation with my artist to get a cool tattoo of a bear in a Hawaiian shirt, which I love, it's great, I love it. <laughs> but halfway through that, I was like, well, can't stop now. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just have half a bear and a quarter of a Hawaiian shirt, and that's not a cool tattoo. But instead, my choice is to become bored. My choice is to get smaller within myself, to get smaller within my body, and simply move forward through my lack of power with the choice that I've made with this body that I have. And so who is the most bored, the most cartoonishly bored members of our society? Teenagers. Teenagers have all the energy and none of the power. They have so much energy, they spend all this energy growing and getting bigger and becoming more of themselves and they're the most themselves they'll ever be and they can't do a goddamn thing because they have no agency, they have no power. And so their boredom splits off in a number of directions. It goes into self-destruction, it goes into self-abuse, it goes into drinking, doing drugs, making bad choices, but it also goes into ironizing. It goes into making ironic, nihilistic humor. And there's a section of the book where you talk about David Foster Wallace and how David Foster Wallace says American teenagers don't understand Kafka anymore. I would invite you to Tumblr where the nihilistic memes are just the hottest thing right now. The, the nihilistic, ironizing humor of the modern North American teenager is, has reached this point that I think is, comes from boredom as a defensive reaction to a lack of power and a lack of future, and a lack of an ability to conceive of a world in a direction where choices are made, that they can make choices. I say this because we have a 16-year-old step-sibling who comes to visit our house every week and tells us about the new memes, all of which are terrifyingly nihilistic. And you look at them and you say, that, is that funny? And they go, this is hilarious. And you say, this is just an artifacted picture of a stick figure saying, please, sir, my wets. And they say, yes, it's funny. I'm like, I believe you. I believe you believe this is funny. And so this question of, this leads me to the question of, can boredom be subversive? Can boredom be a resistance measure? And I think that the conversation that you started about mindfulness sort of gets there, where it's like, if we remove ourselves from this, from the flow, or the stream, or what Jody calls the community capitalism stream, is are we then committing an act of resistance, or are we merely refreshing ourselves for when we inevitably re-enter the stream? and inevitably move back into participation. To which I think my answer, which is going to not be super hopeful, um, is maybe, but only if it is purely selfish. It may, boredom might be resistive if we can engage with it purely as a physical, like as a more, as a way to anchor ourselves more fully in the isolation of the body. And instead of saying this is a mindfulness retreat so that I can be a better manager, or et cetera. Instead, we engage with boredom as a wholly unproductive indulgence. Literally being the teenager lying on the floor saying, I'm so bored, there's nothing to do, and not attempt to redeem it as any type of, ironically, not attempt to redeem it as a politically resistive act. Anyway, I think that's out of time. Great.